All right, let's, let's just get started. Uh, so hi, thanks for coming. My name is Daniel. I work at Meta. I've been working on BPF Trace for just about six years now, I think, on and off. Uh, I've been around since when it first was like open sourced and whatnot. Uh, so actually, this talk kind of assumes you know what BPF Trace is. If you don't know, I'll give you a quick one-liner, but uh, it's, I think you'll probably still find some interesting stuff that you'll learn here. Um, BPF Trace is a high-level tracing language for Linux systems. Basically, it's a domain-specific language that compiles down into eBPF bytecode. Um, it lets you do tracing things, and you know, among, its goal, among its many goals, it's to um, observe anything happening on the system in a pretty quick and easy way that's also reliable. Um, and so this talk kind of focuses on the reliability aspect. So the agenda kind of takes this, uh, takes a top-down approach. We're going to start from the philosophy of the thing, uh, and then we're going to go down to the actual techniques that we're employing, and then we're going to end with current focus. So what is reliability? So I think reliability is a pretty abstract and context-dependent topic, and so to kind of spare us the philosophical discussion on this, uh, maybe just consider this. So let's say you have a problem, and then you decide to use BPF trace to troubleshoot or debug it. Uh, what you really don't want is a second problem at that point, because you already have one problem you're trying to focus on. And so this way, the way I'm going to try and frame uh, reliability for BPF trace is that we don't want any second problems. And so here are a couple examples of uh, second problems, but it's not like a comprehensive list. It's just sort of examples of where you, know, you might be having a second problem. So the first one is clear error if something's not possible. Uh, BPF and the kernel are pretty specialized environments. It's not always possible to do everything. And then you also have the verifier for BPF, which is um, pretty complex by itself. And you might not be able to do everything you want to do. Um, but these are the kind of errors that are like really hard to map back to your source code. So especially if the kernel's yelling at you for something, you, you, know, you want a good error message, and uh, this is one thing BPF trace should do. Uh, we have principle of least surprise. That's pretty self-explanatory. We should not try to really surprise the user or be clever here because the user already has one problem. They don't need a second one. And then a third example is actually, um, I, I believe misleading data is the worst outcome of any kind of debugging or troubleshooting tool because you don't, you know, if, if it gives you wrong data, then you're going to be led down this rabbit hole of, you know, chasing, you know, random dead ends, and you're going to lose sense of reality and just kind of doubt everything. The bottom line is that BPF Trace is a tool to help you. So it's necessary, but not sufficient, for a good tool to be reliable. And that's why we care about reliability. So what's getting in the way of reliability? Um, so let me be upfront on this slide. So this is not like a complaints slide, even though it kind of reads like one. Um, I would sort of consider it as a you know, list of constraints. Uh, and the reason we have these constraints is that BPF, and by extension BPF trace, is a intersection of like notably complex domains, right? We have compiler technology, we have language design, we have the kernel in there, and we also have BPF. And each of these you know, separate technologies have made their own trade-offs. They exist in complex spaces of their own. And so uh, you know, BPF trace sits on top of all these things, and so we have to kind of take what we're given, uh, not necessarily always, most of the time, and then kind of cobble it together into some kind of usable tool slash product. Uh, one example I, I like to give about you know, how complex this intersection is, is um, you know, we use LLVM as the back end to generate bytecode, right? We, we emit IR, and then we lower that into BPF bytecode, and we let LLVM do it. Um, you know, just the way LLVM is you know, developed, packaged, and distributed is like a notable challenge. So one example is, you know, with every release of LLVM, they always change the APIs. And we never know what they're going to change, but they usually always change something. Uh, and so you have to just have this whole matrix testing everything because you have to, BPF trace supports like, you know, the last five LLVM versions or something. And, you know, you have to use all the APIs correctly, and there's a lot of if-defs. Another thing is statically linking BPF trace with LLVM is a tricky one. Users love statically linked binaries. They don't want to like get this whole cra crazy thing, especially the distro is kind of old. They don't have the latest version. They want to use the latest thing, and they want, just want to download a binary that works. They don't want to like set up a build environment. And so I spent like a lot of my time, like probably over 100, 150 hours, just working on static builds. And it was just a crazy mess. But we actually solved it now with app images, which I'll talk, talk about later. Uh, another example is LLVM IR. LLVM is like super useful, but it's also a real you know, compiler um, with 
real serious users who want to do complex things, right? Like Clang is built on top of LLVM. And so there's a lot of trickiness there. So if anyone's ever used LLVM, you would know what get element pointer is, the GEP instruction. That one's always a tough one to wrap your head around. I've read the documentation like 10 times, and I just, you know, the joke I always give is I want to like tattoo the docs to my thigh so I can just look down if I need to look at it. And then there's other examples here, like language design is hard. That needs no explanation. BPF script, which is the language we have in BPF trace, that's what we're calling it. It's not perfect. Uh, no language is perfect, but we, you know, we do try to improve it and make things useful and you know, take it one step at a time. Uh, the kernel is also a pretty tricky place. Uh, it's especially tricky because you know, there's the usual trickiness, and then on top of that, there's BPF, which is a really fast-moving ecosystem. Uh, so you really need to be aware of the ongoing developments to see where you can apply things and when you can actually use certain features. For example, BPF Trace has a soft policy of supporting the last, um, all the active LTS releases for kernels. And so we need to make sure uh, the generated bytecode works for, you know, up back until like five, sorry, 4.19, I think, right now. Uh, and the final point here is open source environment. So this is an open source conference. So it's, you guys are all probably pretty familiar with this, but uh, basic idea is it's a pretty unique environment in that you can't actually hire people or kind of tell people what to do. So you can kind of just gently encourage and you have to work with what you've got. Like for example, you know, you work with GitHub probably. Uh, and, you know, GitHub has GitHub Actions, which you pro also probably want to use and not use something else because of the tight integration. And so you got to work with all the limitations there and just work with what you got. So those are the challenges. Uh, one other thing is, uh, you know, I was kind of doing some analysis because I was trying to see what it would take to get reliability and BPF trace up to the next level. And so one thing I noticed was that there's not really one component in BPF trace, you know, if we invested a lot of time and effort into that would drive an outsized outcome. So when I look at this list of recently fixed reliability of issues, it's not clear to me there's a pattern or even a you know, single component. Um, so that's good and bad. It's good in that we didn't mess up any one thing too bad, but it's also bad that like, you know, it's things like peanut buttered everywhere and so we just have to kind of, you know, well, take things holistically. So that's kind of my approach to it. And the way I sort of uh, view the holistic approach is that it, we don't focus on the code. I mean, we have to focus on the code, right? But it's not as only that as much as it is the entire development process and kind of looking at BPF Trace as a technology that spans the entire stack, right? So the BPF Trace community actually has a pretty good setup these days. I don't think it was always this way, but we have pretty, we have, you know, LLVM contributors, we have tool chain developers, we, you know, we own the BPF, we own BPF Trace, we own the kernel, we own the kernel build, you know, not like completely own it, but we have like investment in it, and so we can make changes anywhere if they make sense. And we can do like surgical things instead of just doing workarounds on top of workarounds. So what does holistic approach practically mean? Um, well, to me, I think investing in CI is the most practical way of putting this philosophy into practice. CI has you know, your clear procedural benefits. It automates feedback. It accelerates velocity. It exercises different configurations, blah, blah, blah. These are all great. Everyone knows this. Um, but what I think is really nice is it's, um, well, sorry, let me back up. So CI addresses like known knowns and known unknowns, right? So a known known would be like, well, this feature you know, it was shipped in 5.4 kernel. I need to make sure it works in 5.4 and, you know, the ones before 5.4, right? We have to support both kernel, um, you know, before and after. That's a known known. A known unknown would be LLVM releases, right? Like I mentioned before. Like, we know LLVM is going to change some kind of API. They're going to break something, but we don't know what it's going to be, so you just have to run that full matrix always. What I find most compelling about a properly done CI, and I have more on that soon, is that it also addresses unknown unknowns, right? So in a very abstract way, I see it as a place where you can encode and store domain knowledge, where it can be indefinitely remembered. Because I'm a pretty forgetful person, so I don't always, you know, my long-term memory is kind of bad for whatever reason. Um, but the machines, the machines can remember forever as long as you teach it how to remember. And then uh, if you make it easy to teach it new things, it's also like, you know, you got the cycle of just chucking stuff in there that, you know, just accrues over time that helps you. But CI is not free. It has its own challenges. I'm sure everyone's interacted with an unhelpful or bad CI before. Uh, I'm not saying BPF Trace to CI is the best thing ever because it's, it's not. I've seen better before. But I actually think it's pretty good for its uh, you know, project scope and the amount of investment we have. 
So in the next few slides, I'm gonna start sharing some of the techniques we developed, um, where they're at, and what we plan on investing more in. So at the core of our CI is Nix. Nix is a lot of things. It's a language, it's an operating system, it's a package manager. But for this talk, let's just call it a package manager. Uh, our entire CI config is housed in a single file, flake.nix, it's checked in in the repo. Uh, from there, we do absolutely everything. And the really cool thing is it's a bit for bit identical build on any Linux system. And we've seen that work out, you know, that promise play out pretty well in practice. Um, something that, so what we used to have was like a Docker-based CI and I spent, you know, uncountable number of hours working on that too. And you know, in theory, Docker is, you can get some kind of reproducibility and it works, but in, in practice I found there's always some kind of sharp, sharp edges there, like depending which distro you have and which Docker version you have, things are not quite so reproducible. Uh, so one nice property with Nix, though, is that the entire dependency tree is in your control. So basically you can fairly trivially, uh, trivially apply a dot .patch to any dependency in your dependency tree. So for example, if you want to apply a patch to libelf, you would check in a dot .patch and teach you how to do that. And then Nix just, it has the whole um, DAG in memory, right? Not in memory, but it, it knows the whole DAG. So anytime you make a change to a dependency, it rebuilds all the lower dependencies, content address hashes it, uh, and then uploads it to a cache where, the, where any user can be configured to talk to this cache. Uh, one user would be the CI. Uh, the cache is obviously optional because you can always do a bit for bit identical rebuild locally, but it takes a while if you don't have a lot of computing power. And so this kind of cache is really useful. Uh, on top of that, there's like really seamless interaction with the GitHub Actions cache. There's like the Determinate Systems has this GitHub Actions plugin. It's literally one line and then it just caches everything transparently. The GitHub Actions cache is super awesome because it's super fast, um, as opposed to like if you want to do a, like a Docker image build, like it's the, you know, it'll hit the repositories and it might not be very fast. You might be wasting these free, free resources. You can also have like a registry to cache your Docker images, but that's just another thing you got to do and you got to set up and you have to authenticate it and whatever. And then I don't know, this stuff just worked, which I thought was really awesome. Not, I, I don't spend all my time doing this, so I was like, this is just a random weekend experiment at one point. Um, yeah, anyways, one, another really cool property is that any of the binaries you build in Nix, especially dynamically linked ones, can be run on the root host without any special tricks. You can like copy it around, you can run it. This is one drawback we had with the Docker system because you know you build a binary in there, but you can't actually run it on your host. It's like, you know, there's like a libc SKU or something. Uh, and so you have to do everything inside the Docker, uh, like an instance, and then it wasn't like super ergonomic because you just had to have that thing open. Anyways, it, it worked, but it, I think this is like actually quite nice. Uh, the bottom line here is that we treat Nix as a highly reliable distribution mechanism. And it kind of fully solves the works on my machine problem without the you know, complexity of other stuff. Uh, in this diagram, I have some examples of stuff you can do. Like you can build an app image, which is like a really cool technology actually. It's like a SquashFS image with a statically linked binary in the front that kind of transfers execution inside of it after mounting it. And so this is how we ship a, a statically linked binary. It's not really a binary. It's like a dynamically linked binary shoved inside a SquashFS with all of its dependencies in there. That's just a tidbit. And then, you know, the CI and whatever uses it, it's a developer environment too. You don't have to install a bunch of dependencies on your host and then start the build. You can just do Nix develop and then make build or whatever. But a CI is only as good as, te as its tests. At the end of the day, a CI should just be invisible. And so what really matters is, uh, you know, your testing story. And so here is kind of how I see the pyramid of quality. Um, this is actually not a super awesome diet. I picked the wrong shape, I think. This is not the right shape. Um, what I'm trying to say here is like the wider in the, in the, in the triangle, the section is, uh, the more issues I expect to be caught there. It's not necessarily the quantity of tests or the amount of time or whatever. Um, if it does correlate with that, that's not intended. Uh, so for example, for unit tests, we expect we, we want most things to be caught by unit tests because they're fast, they're more reproducible, and they're likely easier to write. Um, but we also want a lot of them. It's just not, you know, we just, I just expect more of them to be caught. That's what I'm trying to illustrate. Uh, yeah, I mean, this pyramid has, you know, unit tests on the bottom. We have end-to-end -end tests, and then we have check guidelines, checklists for the review part. And then at the very top is one section I'm really, really actually um, excited about, which is custom linters. And then I think I have a slide on that at some point. The colors indicate current status. So green means, means it's in good shape and that a proper, proper investment has been made. Yellow means it's in progress and we want this to be completed fairly soon. 
Red means not yet, but we want it eventually. Uh, yeah, and if, so the next few slides, I'm gonna zoom into some of the more interesting techniques, in my opinion, that I think we're using. So this is just a slide of uh, some numbers of tests we have. Actually, it doesn't, I should probably delete this because it doesn't mean anything, but it's just to prove that we do have tests and yeah. So this is the first thing. These are runtime tests. That's what we call our end-to-end -end tests because they actually run scripts. Um, at the very top, you see an example of one runtime test and this is um, our mini language. So Russ Cox gave a talk not too long ago. That's the, um, used to be the Golang leader, the lead developer. Um, but he talks about how they use, for the Go, um, a mini language for their tests. And mini languages are this just you know, a small language. Um, we have like a couple hundred line Python parser that does all this stuff. But it makes writing tests really easy and frictionless. And that's super important if you want good tests. You have to make them easy to write. If they're hard to write, people are going to want to not write them. Uh, the diagram below shows how we intend to run these runtime tests. So everything is basically there except for the VM test bit. Um, that I will get done soon, I promise. <laughs> um, but VM test is a small tool that myself and a few folks wrote. Uh, wrote. Basically, it maps the running user space uh, into a guest VM. So everything is the same except the kernel. And so what this lets you do is you can build all your binaries on the root host, which is nice and fast, and then you execute the VM and only run the test in the VM, and you get no shared library SKU or anything because it maps the entire running user space in. Um, if you're wondering how this works, there's like a wiki page, or sorry, there's like a readme on the, on the repo in my uh, GitHub thing. Um, basically uses a network file system, 9PFS, but then we're also gonna add vert.io after we merge this one thing into vert.io FSD. VM test is pretty neat, actually. I use it for development a lot. Uh, for what it's worth, the uh, kernel BPF tree uses VM test uh, in its CI, so it's, it's probably going to be here to stay for a while, and it's regularly exercised. This is an example of a cogen test. So cogen tests are unit tests for cogeneration. So if you'll recall, and I mentioned earlier, BPF trace generates IR, and then LVM lowers this IR to bytecode. And so this is the generated IR pre-optimized. This helps us review cogen changes because cogen is pretty tricky. Um, it's factored pretty well, I would say, but cogen is one of, one of those things where if you make a small change in one place, you can have unintended consequences in other places. And so this kind of helps us uh, do two things. It helps us review changes, like intended changes. Like if I make a change to cogen, I expect it to produce this IR, corresponding IR, but we also want to make sure it doesn't change unintentional, or it doesn't make an unintentional change for cogen. The cogen tests are currently a bit noisy. Uh, so I've highlighted it on the right. This is the line we actually care about because we really want to just test the bit shift left. Um, but unfortunately, we have the rest of it, and the rest of it is just noise at this point. So we want to snip the noise out, probably using some kind of mailing style dot, dot, dot thing, um, and have higher signal tests. It makes it easier to review. Uh, if you've ever developed LLVM before, you would uh, recognize what I'm looking for is file check. And you know, we may well just pull it off the shelf there. So this is really cool. I would actually encourage you, if there's one thing you take away from this, <laughs> other than BPF trace and we care about reliability, is uh, CodeKL is really, really sweet. I'd pull up the slide later if you can. It basically lets you run SQL-like queries on your code base. And to me, it's the ultimate manifestation of encoding domain knowledge in the CI. Uh, so for context, what this query does is catch a bug that we often reintroduce into the code base. So we have this feature in development called the ahead of time compilation. Basically, you do all the you know, analysis and code gen and stuff ahead of time, and then you have this nice small binary, and you can ship this to production and just run it without shipping a full on compiler to production, right? Um, but to do that, we need to serialize a bunch of metadata into this binary. We use a special off section. And the serialization library we use in C++ is called libserial. And the way it works is you have to reference all the members you want to serialize in a struct in this magic member function in the struct. But it's really easy to add a new field to a struct, but then fail to reference it in this magic function. And so this query is something I've developed in like, I don't know, an hour or two that um, finds all the members in, uh, in structs with this serial magic serialization function. Um, it'll find all the unreferenced members. Um, so what's really cool about CodeKL is that there's like really great integration into GitHub, because GitHub bought them out a few years ago, I think. 
And so you have these plugins that lets you just, you know, you can, t you can check in this query and then during code review in the files change tab, it will just, you know, have pop-ups and it'll attach it to the line of code where, you know, you're not doing something. And so that comes for free. Uh, ultimately, I want it to be easy for developers to add queries, to, to, sorry, to both develop and add queries so that when we encounter unknown unknowns, we have a way to reliably remember this stuff without having, like, going through checklists which are prone to human failure. Uh, CodeQL is kind of difficult to run, actually, because it requires, like, Java, and you guys do all these things, you gotta build a database. But this is one thing I think Nix would really help with basically can ship a reliable, it's a, it's a way to reliably ship this environment to developers without having to go through the whole pain of you know, downloading this jar and whatnot. All right, so that is it for the techniques. Now we're moving on to current focus. And so this is, uh, if you use BPF Trace, you might be pretty interested to hear about this, some of this stuff, but these are all the reliability things I'm focused on. So the first one is partially inline functions. So to back up, in case you've never used any tracers on Linux, the way most tracers work, and this is the, I'm talking about the common case, not all the advanced features. The common case is you attach to function entry points. So for some function, um, whenever it executes, so for example, if you're attaching to the kernel, whenever it executes this function, you want a, some custom code to run, and then you also have access to the arguments, and this is how you do your tracing. Uh, one thing it, that does n it is, that's not handled in the current ecosystem is inline functions because uh, the compiler can choose to inline a function and then there's no you know, callable function generated and then all of a sudden you can't find it because it's not in the symbol table. And that's okay because then if you can't attach the function you know exists, then you know it's inlined. But the issue is the compiler does not have to inline or generate a callable function. It can actually do both which is really, really bad, because now your tracer will successfully attach, but then you haven't actually attached to all places and it's a silent failure. And this is a uh, misleading data, and this is really, really bad, and I think it's not been fully solved in any technology I know of, including Dtrace, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. But anyways, we have a bunch of ideas we're playing with, and this is pretty high priority for us. Um, they're in the idea prototype stage. Um, we're gonna solve this one way or another, we're probably not gonna give up. Uh, and hopefully, after we solve this, we will also be able to access arguments for the inline functions as well and all the inline call sites. So that'll be pretty cool because I don't think anyone's ever done this before. One other thing that users have been asking for for a long time are big strings. So big strings, uh, so strings in BPF trace are 64 bytes by default, which is very small. Uh, and it's kind of a teaser. It's like, oh, here's like the beginning of the data you want, but you can't get the rest of it. And I've seen all sorts of crazy hacks um, to get past this. And then finally I decided, you know, enough is enough. We gotta address this thing head on. And so uh, I have like a long write-up about how this works, but uh, we're basically done with it and it works. But it also requires off-stack allocations. It's almost done. It's very close to being done. Uh, the premise is that the BPF stack is pretty limited. It's 512 bytes. Have to, it's, it's quite a precious resource. You've got to be careful about what you put on the stack and what you allocate off stack. Unfortunately, for strings, we have to allocate, we were previously allocating them on stack, so any, that's why there was a 64 byte limit. Um, it's because of the kernel. Uh, uh, and so this work moves all these big allocations off stack into a special per CPU map. We ran, so this, is, this work has been ongoing for a while and we ran into quite a few issues in the process of solving this, but my colleague Ryan has done really great work and he's, we've, uh, he's almost done. I'm, I'm talking like a few days to a week out from completing this. Um, and once that's done, I actually think that's a huge technical milestone because it will kind of pass one of the huge limitations of um, the verifier. But yeah, big strings will need this to fully work. Right now it mostly works. There's some places where you'll get a stack allocation failure, but you know, once this is in, then I'm gonna bump the default size from like 64 bytes to, I don't know, my favorite power of two. I don't know, 512, I don't know, who knows. Uh, so this is dropped events. Yeah, so probes, it's not always safe to run in, uh, BPF programs in the kernel, which is fine, that's an inherent limitation. Like for example, 
and, uh, BPF programs can run NMIs, and in those cases, you know, if you're recursing on itself, we have to just not run the probe, otherwise things can explode. That's just the limitation of being in this problem domain. Um, but what we have to do is report all the places where we didn't run it. So we have to know that we can't run it and then report that we didn't. And that, this should be possible, and it is possible, actually. Uh, the kernel, all the support necessary for this is in the kernel already. So all we got to do is wire it up to user space and report it back to the user. So this is a pretty high priority one as well. Uh, yeah, that is all the stuff I prepared. Anyone have any questions, comments, feature requests? You can complain about stuff too. I'll put it on a spreadsheet and we'll do it. Uh, in regards to like catching the inline functions, like is are the compilers dead code elimination not smart enough, or do you just have some call sites where it actually is not being inlined in is being inlined somewhere else? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure I got the question. Um, uh, um, you're saying that the issue is that uh, um, the debugger or the tracer cannot figure out where to attach the function if uh, the object symbol is there, but it's actually being inlined when it's actually being used in the code, was it? Oh yeah, so, the, so partial inlining is the case where uh, the, you know, the function symbol exists yeah. and is callable, right, with like a call queue or whatever, but it also is inlined in other places. So some places make a oh. call, okay, so there's somebody call, and some places are inlined. It's like really confusing. Oh, so it's not dead code, but it's literally just like, you don't know, it's unpredictable, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not dead code, it's, it's okay. live code. Okay, interesting. Uh, there's a question back there. Uh, yeah, uh, just a comment uh, about that uh, the inline the functions. If you can uh, uh, decode that uh, dwarf information, you can find that uh, the inline function, where the inline function is, uh, or say that extended. So, um, and also, uh, do you have any plan to support that uh, dwarf um, decoding, uh, analyzing? Yeah, so BPF trace supports uh, looking at the dwarf to find the inline instances already, but mm -hmm. it's not a practical solution because, uh, you know, VM Linux, let, let's just consider VM Linux for now. It's like one to two gigs of dwarf, and so mm -hmm. it's like, takes like a minute to parse in user space. No, it's actually that are 10 seconds or so. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. I'm actually that are uh, making a, a path probe, mm -hmm. and e actually that are taking, uh, let's say that on our uh, NV, uh, NVMe or something like that. Okay. Yeah, that, that will be okay. very fast. And uh, um, the last one, I think, that are the probes. Um, you can use that the probes uh, drop count uh, by using that the K probe. If you mm -hmm. use the K probes, you can. Uh, was the count that are in, mm -hmm. uh, missed yeah, 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 count. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I remember, well, so for k-rep probes, there was the end missed thing that wasn't wired up for a long time. I'd had the kernel APIs, but yeah. it wasn't. I, I, like four years ago, I tried to send a patch, and I got super confused by all the feedback, so I gave up. But I think Jerry finally fixed it, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I, I, that's what I'm talking about when I, it's all wired up and ready to go. But, but more on the, um, the dwarf thing. So the kernel is one example, right? But for like hyperscale sized applications, like C++, big C++ binaries, we're actually overflowing the 32-bit counter, not counter, the length field. So it's like yeah. over four gigs of dwarf, and it takes literally minutes, right? And it's just, the CPU's uh, at 100% yeah. trying to yes. parse this stuff. Yes. And so we need, um, I would say, probably a more practical solution, because the tracing cannot be so high impact as to peg the CPU to 100% for like even a second. So we, I have a lot of, we have a lot of ideas. I think one of them should work. Like um, there's the BTF one that, you know, converts the dwarf inline information into BTF, like an extensible BTF section. But that's no, actually, that's a BTF is cannot use for uh, inline functions uh, because that are it, um, for each inline function. Uh, maybe we can, no, uh, the BTF uh, actually that are. Uh, Depends on the K, uh, K all seems. 
So that uh, it only uh, saved that uh, all the, the function names, but uh, that will not uh, give uh, any, uh, what's it, that uh, mapping from the name to the address. So right. that the user right. need to. It, they're gonna extend BTF. They're gonna create like a bunch of new type yeah. entries and it's, I think it's, it was um, Alan McGuire from Oracle's looking at this. So that's, that's one possible approach, but we have some other ideas involving USDTs and maybe that'll be, because USDTs, if you have an uh, entry in the notes section for all the inline things, yeah. it's actually quite yeah. fast and all the tracers support this. Yeah, that will be, uh, that works, yeah. Yeah, we'll see if it works or not. Um, we'll prototype it and some other options too. Okay. Oh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, like, I know sometimes the, the due to the like a kernel side verifier changes that the existing program the programs like a, like a it's like a become not working. Uh, and then, like, a, did you have any any experience uh, in in the BPF trace? And like, if you have, then like, how much of it was like a caught by the CI? Yeah. So one interesting thing with BPF trace uh, is. Because we're not using C for the bytecode or for the BPF program, we're actually in very, we have like full control over the exact ins bytecode instructions emitted. So we actually don't really run into verifier issues that often beyond the initial development. The way CodeGen is structured, it's because like, you know, we have like this AST that we walk and it's like recursive walk. And as long as the code that you generate makes sense in each of these leaf nodes, it actually kind of works, which I was really surprised. So we don't get regressions very often. Because the like uh, the most of those like uh, issues are coming from the optimization of the compiler, exactly. uh, and uh, you have the exact yeah. like a uh, like uh, you don't like a uh, you're you're like a uh, generating the IR, but uh, you don't do any like a uh, further for the optimization against that, uh, and uh, then like a uh, then sure, then like uh, your code is like a uh, pretty much predictable. That is what you mean. Uh, uh, so we do turn on optimizations. We control which passes are enabled, though. But we just. I think we, yeah, we, we for sure have the stack coloring thing going on. Otherwise, we'd be blowing the stack every single time. Uh, but yeah, e even that, I, I think it's probably just um, Clang actually introducing all these. Because if you follow like, Young Hong's work, it's like mostly Clang. And like, L so like Clang will do all these transformations, and then the back end will de optimize some of these things, which is like, yeah, so I suspect most of that um, churn is from the front end. I see. Thanks. Um, so you said that uh, you used to use Docker before for the CI, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I find it quite curious because Docker is all about you know reproducible environments, but you ran into some problems with it, which Nix uh, fixed. So I'm curious, what were the problems? Yeah, I mean, so I think Docker gives you the tools to do things reproducibly, but it's not usually the default. Like, so for one example, you do like an apt get update and then apt get install dash y whatever. That's just the point in type snapshot. It's like things can change. They can add patches. It's not like bit for bit reproducible, right? So the capital R. So that's one example. The other is just propagating like a bunch of environment variables through like multiple levels of Docker and multiple levels of scripts was just, th this was on us. I think we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, another example would be the development environment. Just, you know, if you do the build inside the Docker container, if you do inside the container, you can't actually run it on the root host. So you have to be in that container um, and then you have like UID mismatches or whatever. So these are all things that I think can be solved. It's just that this is not like what I'm an expert at. I'm just like trying to hack it together and make it work. <laughs> and so I'm probably holding it wrong and you can tell me I'm holding it wrong, that's totally fair. But I, I just thought it was easier to hold Nix correctly. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's someone new to BPF Trace and want to help develop it, like, um, where do you suggest uh, them to start? And maybe on the QA part, maybe? I don't know. Uh, so on the GitHub, that's a great question, by the way. Um, how, how, how can you contributors chip in? Um, so on the issue tracker for BPF Trace, we have a, a good first issue label. And if you just sort on that, uh, 
yeah, I think those are some good first issues. More than that, though, they, people can just like email me or just hop on the IRC channel and can ask, like, hey, what can I do? And we'll find you something. Everyone's happy to help. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, no more questions? Go on once, go on twice. All right, thanks for listening, everyone.